Okay. Okay, so I will I will continue and I brought two examples that I've been looking at thinking of this idea of the commons and uh, they're part of my PhD. So uh, I was last year for I was in part of this I mean I'm I'm part of the lecture is part of my PhD and I was in Stockholm last year for about a year. Well, for about a year, sorry, for three months and like different seminars and then three months doing research. And I found some very interesting examples and I, I would like to introduce them to you and maybe we can comment, but you just interrupt me whenever you want to ask before. So the first example uh, um, is the idea of curating or art practice. It's not only curating as creating commons. So uh, it departs from the idea that, well, I will start. So this is example, this example, it was made uh, at Marabu Parken, which is an institution uh, by an artist called uh, Shestin Bergendal, so Kerstin Bergendal, you have it there, I say just in case you want to copy it if you're interested, because I don't think I copied the name later on. So this was a, a project that was, uh, that was uh, developed in a place, in this institution called Marabu Parken, and both uh, cases I'm going to talk about are in the outskirts of Stockholm. And this is very interesting, and I have to give you a little bit of background to that so that you understand why I'm uh, I'm mentioning it. So this institution we're going to see now, it's in here, Sødbyberg yep. Centrum, so you see. And the other one we're going to see later on is Tensta, which is up there. So here, this is easier. This is Sødbyberg Centrum, and then we, we will see Tensta. And the center of Stockholm is here. This is the old town. This is the like the 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 municipality. This is the main train station. So it's this is the the center of Stockholm. So you see, it's quite far away from the center. Um, and well, this is the institution. It's called, uh, as I said, Marabu Parken, because Marabu is a chocolate company in Sweden. I don't know if uh, you've ever heard about it. Uh, I don't know if I touched something. And well, uh, it's very famous in Sweden and in Norway. And this was their laboratory where they tried different types of cocoa in the 40s and the 50s. And then they converted the, the building into an art space. And they also have a collection of a painter. And they have a big park. So one of the interesting things, that's the building and this is the park. One of the interesting things of this institution is that the park that was done around the, well, that was maintained and then cared for around the building was a park uh, that was uh, for the use of the employees of the of the of the institution. You maybe I touched something. Well, I don't have more videos, so I can unplug it. <laughs> okay. So the this Marabu Park, uh, Marabu was the chocolate company, and they had this big park that they gave to the they they gave to the workers. It was in this social understanding of uh, entrepreneurial action, where you could build houses for your workers, you could build schools, you could build a church, and one of the facilities they gave to them to use their leisure and their time was this park. So it is a very interesting space uh, to start with, and they wanted to maintain it like that, uh, because it was a place where you have this, let's say, contradiction of a space that you are giving to your workers for leisure, where you are trying for them uh, to meet together, where you are enhancing their quality of life, but at the same time, it's also a way of having your workers happy so that they will have a stronger connection to your enterprise and they, they will c commit more to, to the entrepreneurial processes. Um, so the, the thing is that when they open the, now it's this art space and they, they still, 
uh, rely on this idea of the of the park utopia and the idea of of this social utopia that that was very much in vogue in the 30s in Sweden, and they try to analyze that from different points of view. It's an interesting institution. But uh, the project I'm going to talk specifically is that when they opened, they did an exhibition that was called Park Life, and they they tried to see what's the importance of the park as a social space. So one of the ideas they recuperated or they looked at was that, uh, well, as you see in this old picture, the the house is there, the laboratory is there, but there are many things around. There is a factory that is behind, but then it wasn't a very populated place until the 60s and the 70s when they started to build a lot. So one of the things they did when they started building in the 60s and the 70s, this is a system that they used in all Sweden. They did uh, what they called, uh, you have it there, Parklek. And Parklek is just a playground, but it's a playground that normally has one or two people who take care of the children or who watch over them and organize like small activities for them. So that it was an informal place where you could bring your children so that they could meet other children, but they could also be entertained. And it was a very important social organization when they started building these neighborhoods because it was the place where people met because everyone was new coming from different areas, very often from different places of the country. So they could bring their children to this park and that they started talking, parents, children, and that's how they started to build a sense of community between the people who were coming new to that place. So they invited Shestin Berriendal to do a project that departed from this idea of the park lake and the, the, the green spaces and the parks as public spaces for meeting, public spaces for discussion and for community making. And well, the, this, is, this is her, Shestin. Um, so the project was uh, has expanded for a very long time and what is interesting of this project is that uh, it entered into a program called Marabu Park and Lab, like laboratory, because they wanted to um, they wanted to have uh, a, some projects that went out from the exhibition space to the public space and try to relate the public space with the exhibition space, which, I mean, if we want, we can talk about that later, if that's interesting or not, or why you have to do it outside, or if you don't, or whatever. But that was the idea they departed from. So they, But the idea of the lab is that it's not a set, uh, a set time. You come, you propose something, you start, and then depending on how much time you need to develop your project, you stay one month or you stay three years. And uh, and you find the res they find the resources depending on what you need. So Shestin actually arrived in 2010, and she's going to finish her project in 2014. So she's been the resident for four years, well, three years, and going to the fourth one now. And and she started analyzing this idea of what were green spaces and how people could how community could be built through these green spaces and what was the pl the importance of green spaces for that. And uh, so there were different phases but the first one that she did uh, well the second one actually but what she did was she started talking to people in the municipality and she discovered that wait there there were two uh, two neighborhoods that were called Hollenbergen and Ur they have quite a strange number and uh, you, th they were these kind of neighborhoods with these kind of buildings from the 60s 70s this is Hollenbergen and these ones are, and uh, they are one next to the other. And there was a there was a plan of the municipality. They have a green space in the middle, and there was a densification program of the municipality that was planning to build in the middle of the two. Uh, so she started talking about that with uh, different people that she was meeting a bit randomly, and she started to see that there was not a very good welcoming from the people living there to this project. So what she did was she went to a to the two the two neighborhoods are linked by a bridge. So she stayed in the bridge and she started giving flyers to people saying, if you want to talk to m with me about what you think about this project, you call me. And then three people called and then she did interviews with them and put them on the internet and then people started coming like crazy to talk to her. And she got 150 people, so she interviewed 150 people from the neighborhood. She's also, this is something that if you want we can talk about too, she's got a very social touch. I think you have to be a very specific type of person to be able to carry out these kind of projects because some people just, you know, you just can engage in conversation in that way. She's really good at that. So she got 150 people to, who, 
Actually, they would call her and she would go with the camera to their houses. She could record them saying what they saw about the plan uh, and then put the video, edit the video, show it to them and put it in the internet. So one of the, the conditions that she gave was that once you have recorded your video, you have to go into the internet, watch your video, tell me what you think, but watch other people's video too. And what that made was that actually people were crossing each other in the street and were saying like, hey, you were talking in that video and you were saying that you agree with this. How can you agree with this? This is shit or whatever. So she, she started to get calls from the people saying like, well, I want to meet with these people who think the same as me or who don't think the same as me. So she started organizing meetings with these people. And, um, and then, uh, well, and to, to put together all the criticisms that people had because mostly the problem, like to make it short, is that uh, especially this place, Haulenbergen, uh, I will explain in the next example battle the system in which housing is allocated in Stockholm, but it's very, very problematic and it's very segregational. It segregates, uh, it segregates people by origin and income very much. So it's really, really problematic in Sweden at this moment. And uh, what they had, this neighborhood had been abandoned. They had taken out the school. It was very segregated, had taken out the school youth center. It was starting to be quite problematic in terms of social living. And they were reclaiming that instead of constructing new things and taking out green spaces, they would renew what they already had. Or So it's quite a common, I think it's a quite a common situation in many places, in many cities in the world. So what they did was she started to meet with these people and she started to do, this was the city's proposal here, and that she started to take all the proposals by the citizens and to establish, like, today we are going to talk about schooling, who wants to come. So the people who wanted to go out about schooling, she, they would come and discuss proposals and then she would introduce them into, into the, the, the plan and she did a maquette. Uh, but actually the maquette was absolutely unimportant for her. She said that the maquette is interesting for the city planners, but for me what is interesting is that these people are meeting together. And uh, she, uh, so she, well, there, there were different parts in the in the process, but she did this maquette and the people in the, in the, in the municipality saw it. They did an exhibition specifically for this maquette. And, and other projects dealing with neighborhoods and so on. And then the municipality was really uh, interested in how she was working and they decided to give her one more year of residency and to give her a permanent space if she, if she agreed and she said she agreed. And they, well, this is the exhibition. In the exhibition, apart from the maquette, there were, this was really funny. I saw this exhibition, it, it happened when I was there. And it was really funny because it, well, it was like a living room and you could see the the like the interviews on the TV, and she put things in the living room that she asked people who was in the interview, like, can I take this for the exhibition? And then all, all the things you saw were like personal objects from the people. And what was really funny is that every time you could go in, you could see like the two neighbors sitting in the in the in the coach and gossiping about the one who was talking and how then he doesn't say that when he's with you and blah blah blah. And then, for example, this I saw this a couple of times. This is the people from the youth center, who in Stockholm, as I said, Stockholm is very segregated. So it's the kind of people you never see in the center, because in the center everyone's. I mean, this is very harsh to say like that, but everyone's tall and and and, and blonde. And and then you go to the to the to the other neighborhoods, and then you see people from the youth center who are there from African origins. So they could come and just watch to all the to all the interviews, and then criticize it. And then one would appear, and the other ones were like, "Oh, look at you! How did you go with these clothes? You're." And so it was a very convivial ambience, which you don't normally find in an exhibition. It was quite strange, but it was, it was funny to go. But at the same time, for you, it was outputting because you had nothing to do with it. You know, and it really felt like it was their project, not yours. But which is not a problem, but it was strange because you don't normally have that sensation when you go to an exhibition. Um, so it was always like people commenting and so on, very, very different kinds of people. Uh, and then while well, she got this space, which is in a in a in a um, uh, how do you say in a shopping mall, and uh, they she called it Park Lake Parla uh, Park Lake Parliament, and uh, she painted everything in pink, and she did this space. It's actually like this. It's just a space where you can meet, which is open. It doesn't have any doors, and she schedules some meetings, and you can just drop by. 
So there's a there's a program that you can see in the internet or that she hunks in this in the in the boards there. She's like, well, this week Tuesday we have builders coming. Wednesday we have people talking about youth center. Thursday we have I don't know what, and you just drop by and you just participate. Everyone gets coffee and cake, and and she moderates like she gives the possibility to. T well, she says like, well, you've talked enough. Now it's for someone else to talk, and you know she's a bit of a moderator. But also what is very interesting is that she has gotten very different kind of people to go. So sometimes she's got the politicians with these guys from the from the from the health center, for example, who are people who could never meet in, in real life and she kind of put them together. So she gives a lot of importance to everyone following the same rules in this space. And uh what's I mean there are a lot of things that you can comment on this on this project is that are I think more or less interesting and if you want then we can just discuss and but well the ideas that she 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 repeats very often is that she's creating a temporary commons. So she's creating a, a, a thing that is there while she's there. And she says that she she normally works this with these kind of structures. And what she says and this I think is very interesting for discussion is that she knows that when she goes, it's probably going to die out. Like the people who are there, they are not a community who are going to continue after she leaves. So she says that's why it's temporary commons and she knows it relies on her, but she thinks it's the responsibility of the people if they are interested in continuing with that way of working, it's their responsibility and not hers. And if they don't keep it, it disappears. Which I think it's very interesting because one thing that I, I think is very interesting to look at projects working with social engaged practice is that when they try to create something new, normally they fail. And when they rely on something that already exists, they have m much more possibilities of uh, continuing afterwards. I mean, creating communities is really difficult. But for her, it's not a problem because she says that she's creating this community. Yes, to well, uh, uh, like what she wants is to. Well, this is a very strange uh, sentence. I saw it this morning, and I saw it was very wrong. But I uh, so don't. Pay. But she wants to make people in the city just see that there are other possibilities of planning things. Like there are other ways in which you can plan things, and other ways in which you can include people. So she said, I don't mind if this process then doesn't give exactly the fruits that the people are hoping for. I mean, I would like it to, but it doesn't depend on me. But I, my objective is that the municipality sees that there are other ways of working, that these people are here, and that they have to face the moment when they look at them and their eyes and say, well, no, we are closing your job center, a center because you're not important to us. And they have to say it directly. So for her, that's that's already something, even if then it closes. I mean, I'll, I'm just saying, like, then we can discuss if you agree or not. But uh, that's what she's giving. And then this is something that I do think is very important. And in both projects I'm presenting, I think it appears very well, is that she puts different kinds of knowledge at the same level. So for her, there's no difference between the the politicians and the the, I don't know, emigrant from Somalia who arrived last year who barely speaks Swedish and has no idea about uh, Swedish politics but is living in that place. So for her they are different kinds of knowledges but they have to meet and they have to acknowledge each other what the other one knows. And, uh, and she says maybe this person from Somalia who just arrived last year doesn't know anything about Swedish politics but what she knows about how is it to live here is something that the politician doesn't know and it's a knowledge that he has to acknowledge. So I think that that is very interesting thing, this, this idea that they are all knowledges and they have to be at the same level and you cannot say this knowledge, my knowledge is better than yours, you just have to accept them as they are. Uh, and also something that is very interesting is that actually she's, she's not searching for a definitive formal outcome. She says, well, we are doing this model. This model is just a tool. If they want to use it, they use it. If they don't, they don't use it. If people are not happy with the model, at the end, we, we burn it. We don't care. But with people, ha what people have learned through this process is much more important than this model. It's much more important. And for example, the exhibition I was telling you about, it was interesting to see because you learned about the project. And it was interesting to see how people who had taken part related to the project. But as an exhibition, it was a shitty exhibition. Like It didn't really have a, a, any kind I mean, it wasn't an exhibition where the objects and the space were appealing to you. What was appealing to you was the project that was happening somewhere else. I mean, it could it could be more like I, you felt more like going to see the areas and see how they were. 
and really go into the exhibition. Yeah, yeah sure. kind of project is more, um, let's say, important, more effective than, let's say, a traditional exhibition? Just a simple question. In I your opinion, because you are, yeah. you are um, supporting this kind of practice, what's the difference for you? Actually, I don't think there is a difference. That's one of the points. Like, for example, the, ne the next example I'm going to show, it's exhibition-based. No, no, no. I just In want this case, because you it's say something that... I mean, I, I can find in, I, be, I found in different uh, situations. Yeah, you mean, uh, like, why I think this is works, well, I think this one answers to a contextual uh, worry that was in that place. Mm. And I think in this case, only in this case, what is very important for her is, and I think is what is interesting for the people who are taking part, is more the methodology and the system and, and the, the new ways of, of empowering people to make them feel that they can take a decision and that people who are in power will come and listen to them. Uh, I think that is important in this project for the people who are taking part in it. And I think in this case, this, this specific case, that could be difficult to arrange in an exhibition. But I don't think that exhibitions are failure and public art in the street is good per se. I think it depends a lot in the project. And okay. I think there are some exhibitions that are super good and super effective in a context yeah. and are in the exhibition space. It depends. I don't know if I answer to your yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, yeah, you, you give me the, the, the answer. And I would like to know how, in, from a concrete uh, perspective, like a commissioning process, mm -hmm. let's say, in you are you are a curator, I guess, no? Yeah. And how would you uh, plan uh, this uh, commission? I mean, would you invite uh, a a, a this artist to to the project? Would you pay her? I mean, I would like to know about the the structure, the economical structure the behind this kind of, of, of this one? process. Yeah. If well, in this one concretely, they have this program, which is the lab, and they have some money that is direct to that. So they start from that. They normally choose the artist depending on, on, on their previous practice and in the specific theme they have to, to address. So of course, if they want to talk about this area, maybe they will take someone like Shestin Bergendal, who's worked with this kind of processual, community-based or meeting interview, so on. But if they want to address other kind of, per, for example, later on they did one about uh, violence against women. They work with an artist who works completely differently, who was there for a shorter time, who was working only with one group of people, and they exhibited, they produced one work that they exhibited in the exhibition. So it was a very different process. Economically, in this case, what happened was that it was very, very successful with the municipality. So they had the money for the first six months, and the municipality <coughs> gave money for the following year and a half. And then after that, actually the last part of the parliament, the, the exhibition space is not, is, she's not a resident officially anymore. It's paid by the municipality only. But the exhibition space is collaborating, showing the work, doing all the mediation, you know, like the, uh, uh, documenting everything. But they are not paying for it anymore. It has passed to the municipality. So the way in which they work is they look for the specific funders depending on the project, which I think is also a very interesting thing that to look for someone who can answer to that, but I think it can also be controversial because of course, one thing she was talking about a lot is about the fact of getting of getting uh, of being used by the uh, being used by the by the politicians to clean their faces you know or clean their hands like give a clean image of we are doing things for the community when actually they don't give a shit which can happen very often. So, but she said that in this case, that she didn't care about that because she knew that al that this process had had empowered very much a lot of people who didn't fa feel before that they had the right to talk. So even if the municipality didn't do anything, they couldn't take out from those people this sentiment that they have everything to say. So for her, that was enough. She thought. Uh, but she said it's very easy to get instrumentalized and very often I, I know I'm being instrumentalized so it's yeah, difficult to pull the line of where I'm instru instru instrumentalized and where not. Yeah, yeah because I, I see this as one of the um, big risks of this kind of uh, practice. Mm. 
we talk about people involving people, but at the end, most of them, it's just using people as tools, you know, yeah, which yeah. I completely disagree. Yeah, no, I think there are many projects who do. I don't think this is the case. No, 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 I'm not. But I'm not uh, but I, I think there are many projects who use people as their material, yeah. and that's, I mean, I think it's necessary to look case by case because there are cases who are really like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, <coughs> can I add something, Edia? Yeah, sure. That I would like to suggest to go out to this general binary system of exhibition versus social engagement practices mm -hmm. in the sense that there is not a better, I mean, there is not a, such a thing like better or worse. It's an option between many. And also the reason why Vessel, for instance, is trying to engage with this is just to experiment this option over here. Then the second thing about the funding structure, there are several projects, like for instance, the Blue House in Amsterdam, Mm -hmm. which started because there was already a plan which is related with gentrification or which is related with the creation of a new settlement of houses or things like that. And then is the city council or the regional council or the province council which is trying to put together the architects, the designers, the artists and say, okay, let's try to implement the creation of a new area of the city with, with art. I know that for us this sounds a bit strange because it's not happening that much over here. So it's, it's difficult. It's far, far, it's far from our vision. Shape. Yeah. But, n I mean, it can happen. Maybe in the future, you never know. And, and also, I think it's a very good attempt to really combine art with society. And this is, I think, what is, at least for us, a plus that social engagement practices is giving to the organization and to the people that are joining us for this experiment, let's call it like that, which is that we are not just speaking about the imaginatory uh, or imaginative sense of the exhibition, but we are trying to deal with reality and use an imaginatory state, which is with people. And for sure, maybe we would never be able to create something like the Blue House in, in Bari. But you never know, you can deal with, with participants or you can deal with communities in so many different ways. Mm. Yeah, and for us it's much more difficult because on, on an economical scale there is not that much support, so that is what is tricky. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I think the next example is really good for what you're saying because I think actually this example of, of Shestin Bergendal, I think it's a very interesting example, but I think it fits more into projects that have been done before related to social engaged practices and communities and so on. So I think it, it worked out well there in Stockholm, and I think it's interesting. But w the one I really think is very interesting for us right now is this one, uh, which is also in Stockholm, which I think is more original. And it's, it's not more original, it's bringing new ideas that I think can open up a very interesting discussion. And it's the program that Maria Lind is uh, doing at the Tenstakunsthal in Stockholm. Uh, I suppose m most of you know Maria Lind. She is a very well known curator and she's she is a character uh, <laughs> but she she does incredible things wherever she goes <laughs> i think that's and uh, and she's got a very strong uh, very strong uh, objectives in Densta. so i uh, this is her here and this is the the bidul library they did this is the space one this is the small space of Tensta. And I have to give you a little bit of background on Tensta because this is really important to understand how what she's doing can be interesting. So Tensta is here, you see it here. So it's almost at the end of the line of the of the tube. And these are big distances in Stockholm because I don't know if you can see very well, but there's blue, clear blue and white. That's because the column is divided in islands. Everything is islands. So the white is the land, the blue is the is the sea. Uh, so that means the distances are really really big. And, and now I'm going to give you a little bit of background on, well, this is the center of Stockholm. Here you see the island thing, the center of Stockholm. I don't know if you've ever been beautiful, wonderful city. Everything's incredibly clean and, and it's it's uh, super well preser preserved and, and very, very beautiful city also with the sea, the nature and so on. This is the center. But there's a. This is the museum island, the one with the greenery, and at the back you see the old town. So it's really, really nice place. But and this is this is Soderman, which is like the the now the popular kind of uh, young uh, alternative bohemian district. So everything's designy, and it's a really, really nice place. A little bit vintagey, and 
But then if you go to the outskirts of the city, the outskirts of the city really look like this. This is what you get when you get like 10 kilometers out from the center. And uh, a little bit about the allocating system in Sweden. You know, Sweden is a social, uh, very it's got a very strong socialist uh, uh, organization, social organization. And one of the things they have is this housing system which in principle is a very, very good thing. So you can sign up for, you sign up for the housing system. There are three public private companies that own a lot of real estate, like 70% of real estate of the city. And they are the ones who allocate the, the a house to you, depending on different uh, criteria. Uh, so you get a rent, which is normally not very expensive, especially compared uh, with the salaries and, and, and level of life of the city to comparing with other European cities, um, where you can stay for the rest of your life if you want, you know, you have very good rights. The thing is that the, the problem is that the, the criteria that they use the main criteria that they use is uh, is antiquity, you would say, like time-based. So you, what people do is when they have a child, they sign him up. So he, when he's 18, that's when he gets into the list, he's got 18 years of, of uh, advantage. Uh, what that means is that if you have been born in Sweden, you have much, m a lot more possibilities of getting the good houses in the center of the city. If you have been born in... I don't care where, and you have come to Sweden two years ago, you're going to be allocated to a neighborhood that is like 20 kilometers far away from the city, from the city center, where everyone else who's there is newly come to Sweden, generally. Uh, and it's very difficult to 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 like to commute to the city or to to have a relationship with that city center because it's very far away and it's a expensive city, so you you really have to you know moving is not cheap. It's not extremely expensive, but it it is some money. And these neighborhoods in the outskirts, they normally don't have so good no social services. They often don't have schools. They often don't have uh, medical centers, or they have less per inhabitant than in the center. Uh, so the situation now is that in Tensta, which is this neighborhood, 87% of the inhabitants are immigrants or sons of immigrants, which in principle is not good, not bad, if it wasn't because they don't generally speak Swedish very well, which in Sweden is an enormous problem to get a good job, because normally they, they rely on language skills a lot for any job that is that needs a minimum of conversation. And that most of the people who have emigrated to Sweden in the last 10 years, they don't have an academic background. And Sweden is a, generally they come from poorer countries and in, in bad situations. So in, in Sweden, it's quite difficult to get jobs without an academic background because everyone has access to education. So people who have been living in Sweden for 25 years, they all have gone to college. So you are really in a very bad situation to get good paid jobs because you don't speak the language and you don't have a graduation. So this means that these places become real ghettos, which very low services, and they are seen by people in the center as ghettos, so they never go there. So it's really like white and black. And it's an image that you don't normally have of Sweden. So it's I, I think it's important to know that this is how Stockholm works as a city. So. Um, well, Tensta, this is the neighborhood of, of Tensta, was uh, built in the 70s and it was into a, well, I'm not going to get into this because it's too long, but it's super interesting if you want, we can, I can tell you later. Uh, it was a program for building like crazy in, se in the 70s in, in Sweden, uh, which has produced all these neighborhoods that are far away and with quite uh, minimal services and related through the tube to the rest of the... So the buildings that you see there at the back, these ones, this is where Tensta Hall is today, this. And this is where the tube station is now. And this is the tube station. So uh, in Tensta, you, well, you have the market, you have like, it's a quite lively area. Also, the houses are not extremely small, but the families that live are quite big, so people tend to spend a lot of time in the street also. So well, uh, and in the last year, for example, there were a lot of there was an outburst of, uh, of violence for Swedish. Uh, <laughs> so they burned some cars, and it was like a big deal. And uh, so it was riots, but nothing to do with London or you know, like with any riots in other places. But yeah, but it it was quite for Sweden. It it was very shocking that these neighborhoods would show their frustration in this way. So well. Tensta is located there, Tensta Konshal. And Maria Lin took the program two years and a half ago, I think. 
and it was it the story of the consul is quite long so i'm not going to go into that but i'm going to show you how maria lind is thinking through it now no it was it came later when uh, stockholm was city of culture uh, but it when it, it when it started it was linked to the idea of uh, regenerating society through art so not in the 70s it was in the 90s but the group who started it they were very much thinking of social engaged like working with the community it did it was born with that idea um but it was also very controversial because I'll, they didn't really get a lot of people to participate because people felt thematized. They felt like they were the subject, like the theme of the exhibition space, and they really didn't. It uh, it worked f sometimes, but not all the time. They were a different group. Um, so well, this is the space. It's an it's an old garage. You can see it very clearly. Uh, this is the first exhibition that Maria Lynn did, but well, this is, it, it was about abstraction and well, it was more related to previous projects she had done. But well, the idea is, this is so that you see the spaces, this is the main space and this is the small space. So the small space is dedicated to exhibitions of books and normally printed matter. Generally, there have been also un things related to collections. Uh, so this was the Bidun library. So, for example, one thing that she's doing is she uh, she saw where the people who are in Tensta come from, and she said, okay, let's do projects that are interesting for these people. So, for example, a lot of them are coming from Arab-speaking countries, especially from the, from the Middle East, uh, not so much from Morocco and, and more the, the the West, but more from the Middle East. Uh, so he, she invited Bidun to bring their uh, whole collection plus the library that they have, so that they were resources that people in Tensta could rely to because it spoke about the very often about uh, situations of the countries, cultural, political situations of the countries they were coming from. So she thought that could be interesting. Uh, but then, for example, the next exhibition she did was of a collection of books uh, but about a girl who was called Katiti, and uh, they were very famous in the, I think, 70s or 80s in Sweden, and she was a Rome uh, girl, and it was, it's, it's, uh, it, they are novels that a real Rome wim woman wrote about her experiences in life in Sweden as a Rome traveling around the country. And she did like young, uh, like books for young people with that. So she exhibited that too. So she was very much thinking about the communities of Sweden who are not uh, considered Swedish by the Swedish and how they, how they live in Sweden and how they relate to this space. So she uh, relates to that, but through art and editorial projects, not like inviting them to come and blah, blah, blah. And then she did this exhibition, which I think, uh, which I did the, my my research about. She invited Heinrich Sachs. You can see the name there. He's a German Swiss quite nomad artist who is actually teaching at the at the at the Royal School of Art in Stockholm, and he's been developing a project on Sesame Street for several years. So he's been uh, investigating how the characters of Sesame Street. Uh, are exported to different countries and how each country has the right in agreement with Sesame workshops to create one new character. So he's been collecting the new characters that had been created in different countries. And for example, one of them, Kami, is from South Africa and it's a girl who's five years old and is, uh, how you say, seropositive? Do you say seropositive? Seropositive. So how these characters that are created in each of the places respond to the, their context sometimes in quite political or provoking ways and how, how people in these countries who have bought the, the program have appropriated it. But how at the same time, this is a commercial program, System Workshops is a huge commercial uh, enterprise who's taking a lot of advantage of that. But the interesting thing of why Maria Lynn wanted to show this in this neighborhood was because actually System Street stopped uh, broadcasting in Sweden in 1982 so actually, Swedish people my age don't know Sesame Street, but Sesame Street is now uh, broadcasting since 10 years in Egypt television, in television in Egypt, and they broadcast it by, uh, by satellite. So a lot of children in Tensta uh, look Sesame Street from Lebanese and Egyptian TV, so they recognize themselves with the characters. 
So she was very interested in putting the knowledge of these children to value and relating them to other places in the world through these uh, places. And actually, well, this is the opening. So it was there were these. The exhibition was most of them are the characters and explanations about the characters and the idea of it's it's more complex if you want to go into complexity. But the very direct thing is this. And then they did a program a project with the school in Tensta for creating a Stockholm character because Sweden doesn't have a character in Sesame Street. So they said, okay, let's create a character for Sweden. So they, they were working for a whole year with a school of children in Tensta, which means that 85% of the children were born from parents not born in Sweden. And they created this character <laughs> all together in, in this combination of, uh, who was also at the exhibition and uh, and it's the Stockholm character. So Maria Lind said, for me, it's very important that it's not the Tensta character, it's the Stockholm character. And if it had been done in the center, everyone would accept it as the Stockholm character. So now the Stockholm character has been in done in Tensta and everyone has to accept that Tensta is representing Stockholm as much as any other neighborhood of Stockholm is. And, and then they did the name giving party in the school with the children. So this is more, this you couldn't see in the exhibition, but you could see the character. But there was a big, you know, working with them there, but also like making themselves feel recognized with something. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a very interesting project per se. Ah, this is repeated. But then other things that she does is like, well, which kind of communities or groups uh, do we have in here? And for example, there's a group of women who are meeting every week uh, to have tea and share like tea and coffee uh, habits of their different regions. And then they do like handcraft. So she said, okay, we're not going to do a project with them. Just give them a space. So they have a coffee, they arrange the coffee and one day per week, they reserve that space for these people. So they come and they are there. And if you want to join them, you join them. And one day is someone from, from I don't know, from England. How she enters in touch with them, and like like how she yeah. approaches them, and how she communicates with yeah. them. Yeah, what she did was she created a quite. It's not a, a big institution. There are like eight people, I think, and from those eight people, two people are working on mediation. And the first year, they the only thing they did was meetings with people in the neighborhood and meeting with them and asking them what they were doing, what were their activities, what they they were lacking, what was their interest. So they they spent she put two people working. Well, I think the first half year was one person. Then they hired another one. They had two people working just to get to know where they were. And she, well, she and other people from the group very often they could. Uh, go all together to the meetings, everyone working there, so they got introduce themselves, so everybody get to know them, they got to know everyone, so they did a very long process of getting to everyone to know them and then to know everyone, but not going saying like, what you can do for me, but uh, on the contrary, like saying like, what what could we do for you? But, you know, like not so much saying like, I'm going to do a project that I think is very interesting for you, but more like, what do you need? And then they could say, well, we need a place to meet. It's like, okay, use our coffee or use our space, you know, like it, it was more that kind of thing. So what I think is interesting in this is that she doesn't go like, uh, we are going to tell you what is good for you. You tell us what you need and let's see if we can get to an arrangement. So, yeah. They had coffee and tea, and then they showed what they like their artifacts. Or no, what? no, actually, this this was the artifacts. This was a specific thing they did. But normally, what they do is they meet on Saturday every two Saturdays, and every day one person takes the care of bringing uh, sweets or uh, sweets and, and tea, and they make an explanation tea or coffee, and they make an explanation of what the social habits are around tea and coffee in their country. So you go and have tea and coffee from yeah from from England with an English woman who tells you because people from the center come too, and then it's just you know it's just what develops around the table with that and it's uh, these people start and then well sometimes they don't sell things but sometimes someone brings like uh, yeah things from their country if if it's like something that is made in their country relating to that they will bring it and explain how they do it or whatever but it's more about meeting people it really doesn't have anything to do with art I mean it's like really much more the meeting and talking than than yeah example brought the things they made and then are they allowed to sell it no okay i think okay 
No. no. No, normally what they do is they bring things from, if, if for example, if they have done something, they, they, they show how to do it, but they don't sell it, no. Like exchange yeah, techniques and things okay. like that, yeah. And then they have another group which I think is quite interesting, which is with the girls from the high school and the girls from the fashion school in the center. And every two weeks they meet and talk about fashion. So different things related to fashion. They have summer camps, right? And they have summer camps with children and curating summer camps. They have a, a, a very big program. And are these meetings then always facilitated by somebody from, like, by members of the staff of? I mean, how how kind of how informal and how much are they by themselves? Uh, normally, one person of mediation goes at the beginning, but then at some point, some of the things they don't go. They just tell them, "This is your space; you do whatever you want," and maybe they help them like organizing, opening up, and things like that. But very often, I several times when I went, there were just people meeting there, and uh, if you want to join, but there's no one from the staff; they just organize their things. Like kind of use our space, our, our space is for everyone, but they are not mediating it. Sometimes, for example, with the fashion, they organize it and they mediate it, or they are present all the time. But for with these women, no. If they go, they go. But if they don't, if no one can go, they just don't go, and they just meet there and they they work on their own. And then just to to finish this part, and then if we still have time, we do questions. But maybe I'm a bit. Now they are doing a very very interesting project, which is called Tensta Museum. And it's a, well, the projects of Maria Linda are always super broad. So th there are thousands of things. This is like a selection of four or three, thi or three things. But uh, but uh, the idea, the basic idea of Tinsta Museum, it's called also like the the new Sweden. And uh, the, the idea is that Sweden is changing and people in the center don't want to see it. So she is trying to say, well, a museum is what keeps the heritage and builds the the personality and the identity of a community. The community of Sweden is very much defined in its image by what has been Swedish for centuries. That is changing. So now Tensta is a museum and we are going to look at Tensta as an example, a sample of what the new Sweden is going to be. So this is what Sweden is now. Let's accept it and let's try to put that into our heritage and understand it as part of our heritage because that's what it is. So it's quite, but she's doing it through a lot of artistic projects. So some of them, and she's working with sociologists, she's working with architects. They do walks in the, in the, in the neighborhood, like explain how it came to be. But then they, they do exhibitions that are really art, 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 like, I mean, art, art, like artistic projects that already existed. But for example, there's the silent university that um, that uh, it's by Omar Ogut and it's uh, it's the knowledge of people who haven't been to sc school but the kind of knowledge they 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 still have from tradition or from their experience and from living so you can go and learn from other people but not in an academic way but other f other levels of knowledge she works very much with the idea of leveling the knowledge and putting into value the knowledge of everyone who's there and not making a hierarchy between them all that said, of course, Maria Lind is a super authorial curator. This is something that we could discuss. I mean, it's not that she disappears, you know, she's super present in everything. So it's very contradictory that, that, that her presence is really, really there. But uh, I think this project, if you can have a look at the web, I think it's really interesting on ways in which she is putting those commons. She's kind of making these commons look like commons, like people be aware that they have that common knowledge, people be aware that they have their common, these common organizations and that they are valuable and that they have to keep having them. She's not going to have them for them, but she's visibilized, visibilized like making them visible and giving them a space. Uh, but not, she's not doing any participatory project where she's bringing everyone. She leaves everyone do whatever they want to do. And then she uh, brings other projects that she thinks can relate to that specific context. So she thinks of the silent university for a neighborhood with the lowest school schooling of, of, of Sweden, of uh, Sesame Street for the only neighborhood in, in Stockholm that still watches Sesame Street. So thinking of exhibition projects that relate to that context in that way, so to respond in in some way, and and I'm I'm over my time I think so maybe.
I'm working about uh, a project about uh, civic monitoring uh, on uh, politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are focused on uh, open data. I'm sorry? On uh, open data. Mm -hmm. if okay. So uh, um, the question is, uh, in your opinion, open data are common or, pu or, or public? And uh, uh, how in this uh, uh, example that you explain now, um, the use of technology uh, is important or not? Uh, sorry for my English, not perfect, yeah, but yeah. I think it's... Uh, well, uh, the comments in the internet is like a whole <laughs> world, <laughs> it's enormous. Uh, I think they, uh, more than public, they are common. They are they, I think they are resources. Open data, I think, are a good example that has th the community of users of it presented as something that doesn't belong to anyone, but belong to everyone who wants to use them and enhance them. So they are not even they they are what I, are called public goods. It's very, of, very often it's called public goods, like something that is should be maintained public for everyone. But definitely, they are commons. They are things that everyone can use, and I think there are very there are very good works on how these commoning, I mean, how these uh, um, groups have uh, organized themselves around these commons. So I think uh, they definitely are commons. And for, but how they are used in these projects, in these projects, actually, uh, the internet, for example, in the case of Maria Lin, I think she is more aware of it and she's trying to introduce the idea of open data, but more than open data is more about the open knowledge in more general ways. One of the reasons why I think she's not, she actually did a, well, it's okay. She did a program where she worked very much on the web page and she uh, engaged a curator who is working with the internet to do a specific web page that wasn't just a web page, but could also be an exhibitionary space. Uh, but I think she's also quite aware that uh, she's working in two levels, one for the art world level, another one for the closer community level. What is very interesting is that sometimes she really gets to mix both, which doesn't happen so often. Uh, for the community, she cannot really work with very advanced technology because people don't have the resources. So it, it, it wouldn't make no sense. And for the international, I think she would need a bigger uh, technology support to really engage into that. But I think she she is really interested on in that. But I don't think she's got the the media to work with that. But she is working very much with MediaTeks, for example. And every time that she does a project, she very often uh, tries to see what information is free on the net and how to organize it so that people can get to it easily. But I don't I don't they are not so present in these projects. But I think there's a whole world that is developing super interesting projects relating to to open data. Oh. Yeah. Um, I have a question about how Maria Lind identified what was, you know, w how she worked with the community to identify what was the issue, what was the common issue, and what was the framework with which to present it. Because what strikes me as um, being distinct from the other examples that we were discussing is that in this case it's a curator intervening and deciding the format and mm -hmm. everyone else in the common or the community sort of fits into that structure. But um, I'm, I'm curious about sort of the process of how, like is she, you know, talking with them on a daily basis and they're telling her that, you know, part of what we want to voice is our social practices related to, you know, pouring tea and this is, you know, and then she's, and she's working with them to create a format for that, you know, because in the other cases, what's common is very obvious, right? Yeah. It's, it's land use or it's resources. Mm. And in this case, there needs to be some kind of filter and some interpretation and um, a way of dissemination. So I'm mm. curious how that, how that interacts. Yeah, well, and the first thing is that she actually, uh, she, she doesn't, well, first she's got these two people she did let's say she put people doing a research where uh, she tried to identify which groups were already working in the place, what did already exist. So, for example, with the tea example, it's not that sh they created it, it was something that was happening, but they did it in private houses or in, in public bars because they didn't have a place to meet. So she only offered a place to meet. Very often it's not so much that she's, uh, she's doing something with them, 
she's just facilitating them to continue doing what they do. So I think that is a, s a slight difference, but that is important. Then the identification thing or knowing about what's going on and so on. I think it's more about the media. It's more the mediation program who's doing that, and she is very much aware of what's going on. She attends a lot of meetings with associations, or she did at the beginning. I don't know if she's doing it anymore. But well, Maria Lynn is at the same time is this contradictory figure where she is a super curator. She is in one Jew one month teach. You know, it's not that she is there every day, every moment, meeting with people, and that people can walk in her office and say like, "Oh, Maria, I'm very worried." It's not at all like that. So for me, it's also an interesting question how she combines this very authorial personality with these projects that are actually... But then something that is very interesting is that uh, she separates very much uh, the spaces. So for example, the, the big spaces where she curates and she doesn't... Uh, she doesn't pretend that she's answering to anything. She brings projects that she thinks are interesting but without uh, saying, well, you know, people from the team, I brought this for you because I thought it would be interesting. She just works with artists and if at some point she thinks it's it's a relevant moment to bring it into the space, then she does. But she she doesn't claim she's doing any kind of, uh, of uh, social engaged work in that. So it's also very, you know, it's a very subtle place where she's putting herself because at the same time she is and she's trying to respond to some characteristic of that neighborhood, but she's not trying to do a socially engaged practice with them. So that's why I think it's very interesting because it's not one way, it's not the other, it's something in between. So I, I, don't, I don't have like a super clear, she does this, 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 this. I think there are a lot of contradictions that are really interesting to discuss. Uh. Thank you so much, Isaiah. Uh, well, it was very good. Uh, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, we are now moving for lunch, so mm -hmm. please feel free to keep on asking questions and move the discussion over the lunch table. And for anybody that is following on streaming, we will be back at half past two, body time, and please stay tuned online. And um, for the rest of people who are not joining us for lunch, we will see you here at half past two. Thanks a lot. <laughs>